Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Either way, I just need you to remember this. Context is everything. Let me say it again without slurring. Context is everything. My name is John Michael. Here at Context is Everything Media Network. Um, what I'm here doing is I'm the founder and CEO of this network. Context is everything. And I figure, well, you know, as a symbolic and a functional gesture, as my first act as founder and CEO of Context is Everything Media Network, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build my context. And I'm going to read this entire history textbook. And if you listen, I hope you enjoy. This is Ambient Classroom on the Context is Everything Media Network. We left off talking about how women in the caste system in ancient India at first had some lenient, even power. They even were given power. Um, but by the end of the, by, by, as time went on, they eventually, widows, uh, women whose husbands passed away, were thrown in the fire with the husbands um, as a repentance for both of their sins. So the women's rights thing kind of went out the window as the caste system system grew very bizarre revelations um brahman moksha nirvana brahman all-powerful spiritual force moksha the pursuit no union with brahman and then nirvana which definitely could be confused with moksha nirvana union with the universe and release from the cycle of life and death. Now that is the key aspect, the release from cycle of life and death, because I guess moksha sounds to me, and pardon my head not being in the frame, I think moksha is like a um, moment to moment thing, and nirvana is past the finish line. That's my understanding of it, but I don't understand. I don't really understand it at all. I grew up, and still am, Catholic. I like the ideas, though, that those folks use, except for the caste system. The caste system doesn't seem very good. Although, sometimes order is orderly. So on a mass scale, in ancient times, a caste system probably is more functional than not having a caste system, because blood and carnage is basically inevitable in the ancient past, and uh, whatever you can do to mitigate that with structures, probably going to be better than not having structures at all. Today, a caste system, official caste system would be bad. Uh, we probably do have some sort of a caste system just uh it's uh kind of got a, a cloak over top of it um but i think people still do have the ability to change the way that they live nowadays much more so than when they weren't allowed to change the way that they lived in the ancient past but i don't know anything that's why i'm reading this book section four chapter four ancient india setting the scene philosophy and religion in China. Oh, so we're headed further east. Oh, well. Setting the scene. Lead the people by laws and regulate them by punishments. And the people will simply try to keep out of jail. But will have no sense of shame. Where are you going with this? Lead the people by virtue and they will have a sense of shame and moreover will become good wisdom of confucius confucius was born in 551 bc to a noble but poor family a brilliant scholar confucius hoped to become an advisor to a local ruler for years he wandered from court to court talking to rulers about how to govern. 
unable to find a permanent government position, returned to teaching. As his reputation for wisdom grew, he attracted many students. Like two other influential thinkers who lived about the same time, Gautama Buddha in India and Socrates in Greece, Confucius never wrote down his ideas. After his death, students collected many of his sayings in the Analects. Analects. Unlike the Buddha, Confucius took little interest in the religious matters such as salvation. Instead, he developed a philosophy or a system of ideas that was concerned with worldly goals, especially how to ensure social order and good government. Confucius studied ancient texts and learned the rules of conduct that had guided his ancestors. Five relationships. This is a subheading. Confucius taught that harmony resulted when people accepted their place in society. He stressed five key relationships. Father to son, elder brother to younger brother, husband to wife, ruler to subject, and friend to friend. Confucius believed that for a friendship, none of these relationships, right? Confucius believed that except for friendship, none of these relationships was equal. For example, older, older people were superior to younger people one younger ones and men were superior to women okay so older people were superior to younger ones and men were superior to women according to confucius everyone had duties and responsibilities superiors should care for their inferiors and set good examples while inferiors owed loyalty and obedience to the their superiors a woman's duty was to ensure the stability of the family and promote harmony in the home. Correct behavior, Confucius believed, would bring order and stability. Hmm. Confucius put filial piety, or respect for parents, above all other duties. Other Confucian values included honesty, hard work, and concern for others. Do not do to others, he declared. What you do, not wish yourself. All right, the golden rule. Don't do to others what you don't wish yourself. Government. Subheading. Subheading. Government. According to Confucius, a ruler had the responsibility to provide good government in return. The people would be respectful and loyal subjects. Confucius said the best ruler was a virtuous one who led people by good example. Confucius believed that government leaders and officials should be well-educated by nature. Oh, should be well-educated. By nature. Men are pretty much alike, he said. It is learning and practicing that set them apart. He urged rulers to take the advice of wise, educated men. Spread of Confucianism, subheading. In the centuries after Confucius died, his ideas influenced every area of Chinese life. Chinese rulers relied on Confucian ideas to choose and chose Confucian scholars as officials. The Confucian emphasis on filial piety bolstered traditional customs such as reverence for ancestors. As Chinese civilization spread, Hundreds of millions of people in Korea, Japan, and Vietnam accepted Confucian beliefs. Close to a third of the world's population came under the influence of these ideas. New section. Heading. The harsh ideas of legalism 
legalism. A very different philosophy grew out of the teachings of Han Fei Zi, who died in 233 BC, according to Han Fei Zi. The nature of man is evil. His goodness is acquired. Greed, he declared, was the motive for most actions and the cause of most conflict. Han Fei Zi insisted that only the only way to achieve order was to pass strict laws and impose harsh punishments. Because of this emphasis on law, Han Fei Zi teachings became known as legalism. To legalists, strength, not goodness, was a ruler's greatest virtue. The ruler alone possesses power, declared Han Fei Zi, wielding it like lightning or like thunder. Many feudal rulers chose legalism as the most effective way to keep order. It was the official policy of Xing, emperor, who united China in 221 BC. It was the official policy of the Xing emperor, who united the China in China in 221 BC. His laws were so cruel that later generations despised legalism. Yet, legalists' ideas survived in laws that forced people to work on government projects and punished those who shirked their duties. Taoism, the unspoken way. The founder of Taoism was known as Lao Tzu or old master old master he said to have he is said to have lived at the time of confucius although we know little about him his credit he is credited with writing the way of virtue a book that had enormous influence on chinese life unlike confucianism and legalism taoism was not concerned with bringing bringing order to human affairs. Instead, Taoists sought to live in harmony with nature. Seeking the way. Subheading. Lao Tzu looked beyond everyday cares to focus on the Tao, or the way, of the universe. How does one find the Tao? Those who know the Tao do not speak it, replied Lao Tzu. Those who speak of it do not know it. Taoists rejected conflict and strife. They wanted the end conflict between human desires and simple ways of nature. They stressed the virtue of yielding water they pointed out, does not resist, but yields to outside pressure. Yet, it is an unstoppable force. Many Taoists turned from the unnatural ways of society. Some became hermits, artists, or poets. Government. Subheading. Taoists viewed government as unnatural, and therefore the cause of many problems. If the people are difficult to govern, Lao Tzu declared, it is because those in authority are too fond of action. To Taoists, the best government was one that governed the least. A blend of ideas. Subheading. 
Although scholars kept to Lao Tse's teachings, Taoism evolved into a popular religion with gods, goddesses, and magical practices. Chinese peasants turned to Taoist priests for charms to protect them from unseen forces. Instead of accepting nature as it was, some Taoist priests searched for substance to bring immortality. Immortality. To achieve this goal, they conducted experiments. Sometimes their work contributed to science and medicine. Gradually, people blended Confucian and Taoist teachings. Although the two philosophies differed, people took beliefs and practices from each. Confucian, Confucianism showed them how to behave. Confucianism showed them how to behave. Taoism influenced their view of the natural world. Buddhism in China. This is the final heading of the chapter, and I have a question for you. So uh, if you're listening in your headphones or... Uh, if you're listening on your ambient noise generator that you have by your bedside that sometimes features um, the great call of the blue whale or the squawking of the regal seagull over top a giant pile of garbage, I just would like to lend you my ears and ask you a question. Do you prefer that I have the camera orientated that I'm looking directly at it? Or do you prefer that I look over this way more often? Because this is the first time that I'm filming this with the camera directly in front of me rather than to my side, which is leading me to read more directly with some more of a facsimile of eye contact here. Now, my question here for the comments is, is it better to do this, or is this more welcome when I'm doing this? Is it less intimidating? I know I'm, I'm an intimidating guy. I probably should start ironing my shirts. Way to end with a sputter there. Buddhism in China. By 100 AD, missionaries and merchants had spread Mahayana Buddhism from India into China. At first, the Chinese had trouble with the new faith. For example, Chinese tradition valued family loyalty while Buddhism honored monks and nuns who gave up the benefits of family life for life of solitary meditation. Despite obstacles such as this, Buddhism became more popular, especially in times of crisis. Its great appeal was the promise of escape from suffering, Mahayana Buddhism offered the hope of eternal happiness and presented Buddha as a compassionate, merciful God. Through prayer, good works, and devotion, anyone could hope to gain salvation. Neither Taoism nor Confucianism emphasized this idea of personal salvation. Oh, interesting. So Buddhism has a a salvation, what do you call it? Salvation arc. There's a way that you can go towards salvation, whereas the other ones are more societal, structural. Taoism and Confucianism, that is. Am I mumbling? Could you leave that in the comments below? I'm asking as a favor. Thank you. Am I mumbling? As a favor, could you answer if you're listening? If you got this far, 
do me a personal favor. I'd really appreciate it. I'll reply. I'll give it a heart. If it allows me to, I'll give it the jeans pants emoji as a response. I will. I'll try. By 400 AD, and we're nearing our end of our time here, by 400 AD, Buddhism had spread throughout China. Buddhist monasteries became important centers of learning and the arts. Buddhism absorbed many Confucian and Taoist traditions. Chinese Buddhist monks stressed filial piety and honored Confucius. I still have yet to buy a fresh set of unmarked sticky notes. I will write some brief notes on this chapter and I will put them inside this book so that I can hopefully remember some details. Because the point of this whole show, not only to upload content for the Context is Everything Media Network, but it's also to build some context in my old noodle here. I want to practice what I preach. If context is everything, if it is indeed very important, I should have context of the history that has led us to where we are today, which is why I'm reading this book, and which is uh, another reason why I appreciate your patronage, watching, and commenting to help the show grow. This is John Michael at Context is Everything. The bell's about to ring. Thank you for coming. Uh, and for the remainder of the class, you can chat among yourselves. Oh, that would have been great if the bell just rang right there. 40 seconds left. <clears throat> um, notes that I'm going to put. Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. And I'm going to put like one or two words underneath each to indicate things about them. So, let's see. Um, no homework tonight. Uh, have a good day. Uh, and thank you for not packing up before the bell. <laughs>